doesn't want to turn on. There were several in here earlier listening to me test it and be silly with my husband, and now it does not want to even turn on. <laughs> Good morning, by the way. Welcome. Oh, there it came on. All it needed was him to come close, and then it turns on. Do you see how that works? Oh, the Lord is a funny, funny, funny one. The Lord does have jokes this morning. I'm telling you, if we weren't laughing, we'd be crying some days, right? So welcome, welcome to worship this morning at Wesley. My name is Pastor Sylvia Harris, and I am honored, and it is a joy, as always, to be with you in worship. So a couple of items this morning. As a reminder, it's been a while since I've said it, so I'm going to say it today. See, it's still breaking up. Nice try. Anyway, don't worry. We'll get through. There's an attendance prayer card in your bulletin. Take the time to fill that out with your best contact information so that we know how to reach you, so that we have updated records and all of that stuff. But most importantly, on the back is where your prayer requests go. Let me know how I can be in prayer for you in the coming week. And these, of course, can be put in to the offering plates anytime during service or at the end of service. We have um, two plates up in the front as well as one in the back. Um, we still don't pass them. I don't know that we'll ever go back to passing offering plates because, you know, we just haven't for how long now? And it's working out okay. So... Uh, Put those in there if you're interested in other ways to give. We should have that right in there. If you're interested in that electronic giving, we've got the QR code in the bulletin for you. And we've also got it listed online for those who are watching us live. We've got it on our Facebook as well as on our website, how to give online um, through digital modern means. What else do I have for you today? We continue to collect non-perishable food items as well as water for um, having on hand over in our cooling center. Uh, I know we didn't have the extreme heat this week. We had monsoon humidity heat, um, but we're still seeing upwards of 25 to 30 people daily coming through over there. Um, and so it's an important thing that we continue to have on hand for the unsheltered and the most vulnerable um, in our community to be able to access that. Also, along the same lines there, we continue to seek volunteers. Anybody from the church who wants to come and volunteer, please don't hesitate. Uh, Ms. Rosalind Gordon continues to be our point of contact who's organizing the volunteers and such over there. So if you're interested, you can either let her know or myself know, and we will get you on the schedule uh, to come and be a part of that opportunity. I believe we're having fellowship today after church. I believe we're having a birthday fellowship, but I'm not sure because I've not seen who I would think from SPRC is handling that. So we'll see if there's cupcakes or cake over there afterwards. We'll get a sugar high. If not, then we'll just have a fellowship with one another high. How's that sound? <laughs> we don't always need sugar to spend time together, contrary to what my children think. Okay. Those are my announcements for you this morning, and so I would invite you to please stand as you are able as Miss Janice Keith comes up to lead us in the call to worship. Good morning, Wesley. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Sing praises to our God. God's love is sure. Christ's love never ends. Shout for joy, all the earth. Proclaim the Lord's glory. God's salvation is sure. God's faithfulness never ends. Our opening song is found on page 140 in your general interview. It's great is thy faithfulness.
holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, with the city, the city of the great king, within its citadels, God has shown himself a sure defense. Then the kings assembled. They came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in panic. They took to flight. Trembling took hold of them there, pains as of a woman in labor. As when an east wind shatters the ships of Tarshish, as we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God establishes forever. We ponder your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. Your name, O God, like your praise, reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with victory. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the towns of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion. Go all around it. Count its towers. Our next reading is from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. us and raises us to new life. We come before you on this day asking that the words of my mouth and the meditations of the hearts and minds of all those hearing my voice be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you alone are the one that we do everything for and give thanks in always. Amen. 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 Friends, we have spent the month of July journeying through the book of Colossians and the theme of freedom. 
We started the month off talking about the revelation of freedom as seen in Jesus Christ. And during that, we talked about how the life and ministry of Jesus, a life and ministry that was focused on setting free the captives and liberating the oppressed. We talked about how true freedom that is revealed in Christ does not constrain, exclude, or restrict anyone. That true freedom includes everyone, always. And then we talked the second week, we talked the second week of July about freedom redeemed. That we can sit in our own redemption and be satisfied there. Or that we can cultivate and build our faith, build on our redemption so that we want to share it with others. We want to share it by taking care of those who we run into in the streets who may need our help, or we cultivate it and we take care of it by sharing and inviting others into our space of worship. We talked about the difference between the wild vine and the cultivated vine, and that we can choose to be the wild vine or we can cultivate our faith intentionally. And then we talked about the reconciliation, right? The freedom of what it means to be reconciled. And that the reality is that all of creation, all of creation is created through and reconciled by Jesus Christ to God in heaven. And that if we believe that to be true, then that means that no one anywhere is ever to be left out of what it means to be reconciled in Christ. And that not only is no one anywhere ever to be left out, but that we have the very spirit of Christ, which means the very spirit of reconciliation in us. And so our lives are to be lived in a space that seeks to reconcile everything and everyone to God. And then last week, yes, yes, we had my issues last week, as we've already discussed. But last week, we talked about the restoration part of freedom, right? We talked about that things that can hold us captive in this world, the things that are not of Christ, they can take away our freedom and put us back in bondage, that there are things that are of this world that, that we can and do often cling to, or we can seek the restoration, we can seek that experience that restores us to the connection to the head that is Christ and live into what it means to be fully whole, to be fully restored in the greatest way possible, and that that restoration is found when we live in the truth of Christ. So all of that has built, and I remind us of that, because all of that has built to today. Today, when we're going to wrap all of this up, I hope, with a nice bow or at least an end point of sorts for the month. And in many ways, the more I've thought about it, the more it's it's not so much a bow or even a period, but probably a semicolon, which means come back next week and see where we go from here, right? A semicolon means it's not the end. So with that little hook for you about next week, today, today we're going to talk about the freedom revealed in Christ. How the freedom revealed in Christ, where we started, reconciles and redeems all of creation where we journey, restoring us to the fullness of life where we were last week, finally culminating in how we are renewed, renewed in the knowledge according to the image of our creator. When we have the freedom of Christ, we are renewed in the knowledge of our creator. And if we do what the scriptures teach us, Whatever we do in word or deed, doing all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. If we do that in our lives, in all things, we then are renewed in the knowledge of our God that is our creator. And that leads us back to understanding just what it means to have the spirit of Christ in us. Put another way, perhaps more simply, the renewal of the knowledge of the Holy One helps us to put to death the ways of the world and instead live as if we are already in heaven. To be renewed in Christ can be explained in this way. Biblical scholar Grace G. Sung Kim writes, to believe in Christ, which we do, right? We believe in Christ. To believe in Christ is to put to death all anti-Christ-like attitudes 
and practices in one's life. If we believe in Christ, then we should be putting to death all anti-Christ-like attitudes and practices in our lives. If we are renewed in the knowledge of God, that means we are renewed in the life of Christ, and we are putting to death all that which would separate us, all that is anti-Christ-like in our attitudes and practices. As we journey through the rest of this message, I want you to put on your own personal lens. I want you to think about your own attitudes and practices that keep you bound up to this world, that keep you bound up to this world, and think about how you can put them to death. When we hear the words of Colossians 3, the message that Miss Janice read for us this morning, we hear this message that tells us that we are both put to death with and raised with Christ. We are in this now, and we are also in this later sort of place. It's a now and later kind of thing. We are told, first off, in Colossians 3, verse 1, So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. This very statement implies, if you will, that we have already been raised with Christ. If we aren't already raised with Christ, then why are we even considering this, this message whatsoever, right? And yet, how can we be raised if we're still here in this world doing this daily thing called life? There is this anticipation, if you will, to what it means to be raised with Christ. And we find that then in verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. The author of the letter to Colossae starts off with the now and later, but instead of putting down first, he puts later first. If you are raised with Christ, that's the later thing that we get to look forward to, right? If you are raised with Christ, that's going to be confirmed for you later when you have the revelation of glory in Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I know that I have heard and I have learned, and I think I've preached on it before, so you should know this as well. Um, the promise that we have of being raised, we've got a seal of sorts, right? We've talked about this before. The Holy Spirit is our down payment in this life that assures us that we have been raised already with Christ. So putting the later part before the now part, before living in the now part, it reminds us of the promise we already have, the promise we have already received. It reminds us that we are already saved by grace alone, which means we can assume safely we've already been raised when the time comes. That's already been taken care of. And so when I read this Colossians 3, I can't help but to think, what can I do to thank God and praise God for this gift so freely given. What can I do? It's not a work of salvation. It's not a work to assure that I get raised because I've already been raised. It's what can I do to say thank you and praise you for what has been done freely for me. Do you follow that? Okay. Put to death whatever in you is earthly. Put to death whatever in you is earthly. Put another way, the author could say, crucify in your life the things that keep you captive, the things that bind you to this world, the things which keep you from being renewed in the knowledge of the Creator. And yes, the author of the Colossians text gives us some examples. And of course, scholars have speculated over their specific meanings, right? The reality is, I, I believe anyway, that the reality is that the author gives us vague examples so that we can find our place in them. And so the author writes to put to death whatever in you is earthly, and it goes on to suggest sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. 
And I'll give you that. Greed and idolatry, I can get behind as being more specific, perhaps, than some of those other suggested things. But oftentimes, what people have assumed, because of the nature of this particular list being very physical, very much in the physical realm of this world, that's part of why scholars say that whole Gnosticism, the debate between spiritual and physical, and what's more important. Whatever it is, though, I think what we need to focus on here, what I'd like to focus on for us anyway, is that we need to put to death whatever is earthly. Whatever keeps you bound up to this world so that you're not able to experience in this world what it means to already be raised with Christ. This is some of that personal application I mentioned a few minutes ago, right? What is keeping you because what's keeping you isn't necessarily what's keeping me or the person beside you, behind you, in front of you. What is keeping you bound up and captive in this world so that you cannot experience the fullness of the freedom revealed in Christ? If you take notes, write that down, ponder it in the week to come. I don't expect a light bulb or a, that's it, right now. But just think about it. What keeps you bound up, connected more to this world than to being raised already with Christ? The author of Colossians goes on to give us a few more examples, a few more things to suggest. Things that we might consider getting rid of. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive language, lying. I think sometimes it's easier to get caught up in these specifically named things and really try to categorize it and try to say, oh, I don't have wrath. I don't lie. Yeah. It's so much easier to do that, right, than to think about the attitudes and beliefs that perhaps keep us bound up in these spaces at times. We can focus on washing mouths out with soap so that there is not abusive language. And we can focus on those words, you know, those words that I don't like to hear my children say. Or we can focus on abusive language as being that which demeans or dehumanizes others. And language that demeans and dehumanizes another person who remember all are reconciled Language which demeans and dehumanizes other people are based on what? Our attitudes and beliefs that bind us to the worldly way of being. We can focus on slander and lying, and we can even go into thinking about perhaps some envious, jealous things that we have going on that lead us to slander or to lie, perhaps. Or we can think about the attitudes and beliefs that we cling to that ultimately distort the way we perceive and engage in the world, that lead us to the envious jealousy and the slander and lying. What are the attitudes and beliefs that keep you bound to this world? We can keep it surface level. We can, we can go, okay, it's my attitude and belief about consumer culture. My husband's going to like this example in some ways and not in others because, you know, the personal versus the professional way of life. We can think about consumer culture, and so we can put to death our relationship with Amazon. See? You like that? <laughs> amen. You have amen in the back. All right? But the bigger question here isn't so much about my shopping platform of choice but it's about the attitude and the belief around excess and stuff and whether or not we really need something right away, you know, or whether or not we need to perhaps put in some patience and think about it a little more. What is the attitude and belief behind it? What are our attitudes and belief about people around us? Those perhaps who are unsheltered, or perhaps those who aren't from this country, or perhaps those who don't look like, believe like, live like me. 
Maybe we need to die to judgments as a whole. Judgments that tell us who is worthy and welcome and what it means then instead to be able to see another person in truth and to recognize that all creation is reflected in whoever is in front of you. Our attitudes and belief about who is in and who is out ultimately tie us to this world in such a way that we struggle to really embrace that all of creation is formed through and redeemed in Christ to God. And when we struggle with that, do we really believe that it includes all of creation, includes the person who loves differently, who lives differently, who smells funny, who has some shifty eyes? Surely it doesn't mean that I have to start to believe that that person is included too. My friends, only you know what your heart and soul and mind are telling you right now about the attitudes and beliefs that you carry, about what keeps you captive and bound to this world such that you are not able to be renewed in the knowledge of our Creator. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. The things we are to die to in this world will not have these markers. My friends, when we stop and we wonder what it means to die to the things of this world, what are the attitudes and the beliefs that I carry, we can test the truth of whether or not something is from above or below when we know how the things from above are revealed. What are the markers? What are the carriers? What are the attributes, big word, of the things that are of above? And the scripture tells us that if we are to do this, we are to clothe ourselves with these things. Compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Now, I'm not trying to say that we're going to get it right every time. But if we are being renewed in the knowledge which is in the image of the one that we serve, if we are being renewed in the knowledge which is the image of our creator, then we are coming to a place where these become our measuring sticks and our standards. These are the ways that we know if we are living lives that are praising and worshiping our God for the grace we don't deserve. Are we clothing our lives? Are we living day to day, engaging in our relationships and our very way of being in this world from a place that is clothed in compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience? Not only these, but the author goes on to say, bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, Forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. It's so easy to keep score, isn't it? I know in my life, once again, my husband will attest to this as well. I know he's, he's great for this kind of stuff in worship. But I know in my life, I have a tendency to even keep a false score, right? I'm fond of saying, you always... <laughs> And fill in the blank. I make these all-consuming, blanketed statements about what happens or doesn't happen in our relationship, in my life, with our children. I do it everywhere. This is my professional booth today. Okay? And there are times when he counters me on that that I think, I really should keep score. Just so I can show how close to always this really happens. It's so easy sometimes to keep score, isn't it? Instead of stepping into that place of forgiveness. I think our relationships, whether we're talking about our significant other, or we're talking about our parents, our siblings, our children, our friends, it's so easy to want to keep score. You always, or you never, which in some ways, 
whether we say it or not, then gets followed up with, so why should I be, do, say, or act? Why should I forgive? Forgiveness, whether it's for the toilet seat left up or for the parent who has failed to love you in the way that you need it or anything in between. Forgiveness is about the peace that passes understanding, coming to rule in your heart that you are no longer bound up in the pain of the situation, the relationship, the circumstance. Did you catch that? You're no longer bound up. Forgiveness is about freedom. Keeping score keeps us bound up. Now, this is not about condoning or saying that you deserve to be hurt or harmed in any way. Forgiveness is about creating a space for healing. That's what God has done for us on the cross. God has created for us a space for healing. A space that we can heal from the wounds we have inflicted, from the pains that we have caused. Because the reality is as much as we need to forgive, we also need to be forgiven. Bear with one another and forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds up everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Be clothed in love and reverence. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Be thankful as the word of Christ dwells in us richly. That is the spirit of God that we have talked about, the spirit of Christ that dwells in you. Let that be in you richly. Not in poverty, not in small measure, richly. Friends, when we are renewed in the knowledge of our Creator, we are renewed as an understanding of what it means to follow Jesus. Of what it means to live lives that set at liberty the oppressed, that give freedom for the captives. When we are renewed in the knowledge of our Creator, we begin to see the world through the eyes of Christ. Because Christ's Spirit dwells in us richly. And so we can remember that in all things, in all things, there is the reconciliation through Christ to God. When we learn these truths, when we live these truths of what freedom really is, as we restore the broken places in our lives and in this world, we will naturally do what the scripture says. We will naturally begin to be operating day in and day out more and more from this space where everything we do, everything we say, every word, every deed, we are living in the name of the Lord Jesus, showing the world our praise to God the Father in all things. In everything you do and say, everything you do and say in the name of the Lord Jesus for the praise of God the Father. That's what we're called to. That's what we're claiming to. When the Lord Jesus rules in your heart richly, you will be clothed in love, which binds all things. And that, my friends, is the way that we can share the good news of our freedom with all creation. Amen. Amen. This is the time for response and witnessing. Are you ready to do the um, thing for annual conference as well? Okay. Does anybody have a word on your heart that you wish to share? Last week I announced, well, first of all, good morning, church. Last week I announced that my uh, grandson's wife was seeking employment as a nurse because she had received her, her license. And when I got home last Sunday, they were at my house to let me know that they
they will be moving to Nashville, Tennessee. She accepted a two-year contract as a nurse there. Oh, that's so, uh, they were a good proud person for them, and um, they, they will realize that now they have to depend on each other. Uh, they have lots of family in Prescott, they have lots of family here, and everybody is like always a, a safety net, so they, they won't have that. So keep them in your prayers. Wonderful, thank you. Ms. Friday, did you have something? Church, I just want you to know my sister Margaret Armstrong, her health is really declining. And I'm just asking the church to continue to pray for her. She's not in any pain, and she's beginning to eat a bite or two and maybe a sip of a little water. But she still enjoys family and friends when they come around. Margaret Armstrong? Yes. Thank you, church. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I can remember a time, you know, when I, the doctor said I was going to die. You know, I didn't have a chance. I had prostate cancer, and I got down to 98 pounds. And um, they called my mom, and they said that she should get a criminal proceeding for that because they didn't think I was going to make it. The cancer was so aggressive. And I fasted for 30 days, you know, and I believed in God you know, to heal me. You know, and God opened up doors. I mean, when I, when I came out, the doctors asked me, what did you do? And I said, what do you mean what I do? You know, so they took x-rays, you know. And I said, I fasted for 30 days and said, God will you know. And I said, I don't take every day for granted anymore. And neither should either of you, you know, because you're not, you're not promised tomorrow, you know. You don't know what's going to come your way, you know. But in every situation, I gave God bless and consolation that my trials came to only make me strong, you know. And so every single mountain, you know, that I go through, now they tell me I have polio, you know. Lose my ability in my leg, but you know what? I don't care because if it's my time, it's my time. You know, but I just rejoice in the Lord because I know that if I don't know how long it's remains, and I don't know what's going to happen, but you know what? It's in your hands, and if He heals me, that's fine. If He doesn't, that's okay because I know who my God is. You know. And then God will open up doors I mean, for me to minister to people you know that who might be in a worse situation than I am. You know. And, you know, and, and so I see the Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice because rejoice in the Lord is our strength. Don't allow people, places, or things, or situations mean to steal your joy. Because that's what Satan wants. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to steal your faith. You know? So in every mountain that we problems I mean that we might go through, you know, are just trials. They're just trials. You know? And when you overcome them, okay, you can look back and say, if God got me through this, he'll get me through that. You know? So I just, you know, thank God for being and uh, thank you, you know, for this morning, and God bless you all. When we came to this church, probably in January, my husband was diagnosed with uh, colon cancer, and I just want to thank the church on Tuesday. The doctor came in, he said, you are free, you're clear. <laughs> And thank you for this church. My nephew at the same time had a belly fever, 13 year old. And we were told that the fungus was coming out to his ear. 
and we were just waiting to get to the brain that he's got. But through prayers at the same time in this church and throughout the world, he's now going to high school this coming season. So thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you for that. I'm going to invite uh, Ms. Kimulet Windsor up to give you your report from the annual conference. Oh, Mr. Jennings, real quickly. Okay, well, wonderful. I had a wonderful time yesterday with uh, Betsy Woodruff. Her mother, Mother Cat, had her 90th birthday celebration. Oh, it was really wonderful and elegant. Wonderful. And also, there will be refreshments and because um, Alice is bringing cake. Okay, out. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jennings. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So great to hear the praise reports. I remember as a young person, uh, we went to strategic planning, and one of the things that we said Wesley was known for, even though we were individually working in the community and humble about all the great work we did, but that Wesley was a welcoming and praying church. And so it is great to hear that prayers are reaching out in, in, within our community Amen. and outside of our community as well. Amen. So I get to be here this morning. Once again, I was here last year to talk about the annual conference and updates and uh, business. It's a business meeting and what's going on. So I'm here to share that with you briefly. I set my timer, so I'm not here for very long. Um, it was a, it, it, as people show up to conferences and to meetings, part of what you get is based on how you're feeling and what's going on in your world, right? So um, this conference struck me a little differently than the prior conference. And as I give the report, I ask you to um, process it in that way. It's my perceptions of what happened. And I will share with you the conference information is on the conference website. So you can go through and experience this year's conference for yourself. It, three days, it started with the laity session, which was on June 8th, and the speaker presented on uh, care for the dying. It was in June, what around here. So as I processed what she was talking, that whole presentation just struck me the wrong way. I'm not interested in talking about dying in the middle of a pandemic. I'm not accepting any of that. But what she did say was our first, our last, and all the rest in between are sacred. And so I'm all about the rest in between and what you do with them. And so I took that away and said bye-bye for the rest of it. The uh, business part of the conference, June 10th through 11, um, happened while I was transitioning Gabrielle's camp. And the camp is a uh, human uh, humanities camp. It's all about justice and diversity and equity. And one of the first sessions, uh, and, and we, we had a moment in America, and so one of the first sessions was about um, a motion to make the conference a gun-free zone. At which point I thought, are you kidding me? It's church. <laughs> um, but in processing it in context of what we were going through in America, right, it made sense that we had to be on the same page about the conference, which was in Mesa, in person, um, being a gun-free zone. Well, that's it, we spiraling as well, <coughs> saying, what is happening in the church where the world is invading our peace and the work that we do for Christ? So one of the other motions that happened at conference was in response to, and again, you can get all of this on the conference website, was in response to actions taken during the Florida conference. And the process for the Florida conference after individuals go through all the work and effort to become clergy, like years, right? They invest years in doing this work. They are in line with the people, their mentors, and the programs that they're supposed to go through. And in 
Florida, they have a slate. So everybody who's up and ready to be confirmed, right, if they go on the slate and they just perform, right? They just confirm everybody. This year, the 16 people that were ready to go into the ministry were not confirmed because they had people or person who was openly gay as part of that slate. So they stopped them all. They said, no, we're not doing it. church, right? I, I don't get it. But at our conference, we took an action to recognize those 16 people. Um, the other part of the conference that's important, if, you know, if you're reading any part of maybe the back pages of the paper about churches and what's going on, there's a report about um, the numbers, right? Everything is down. Everything is down going to church, people aren't active in church, people aren't giving to church, it's all down significantly. Um, what's also happening is there is a delay. Once again, I told you about the delay last year. It's going to be in 2023 when we would have our general conference. The general conference is once again delayed to 2024. Well, there's much to do about that as well. At the same time as we were having the conference, the my words, new sect of the, of the Methodist Church started officially. They didn't want to wait. Um, and politics gets in the way, personal beliefs get in the way, but they didn't want to wait. So the Global Methodist Church, which is a more conservative theological sect of the United Methodist, I say a part of the United Methodist Church, but Methodism, um, has begun, and the work that was done to a um, settlement around what's happening in the United Methodist Church in 2019-2020 um, was intended to be, as I understand it, a short-term fix. And so this is about where money goes, where people go, and all that. Um, it was agreed on, uh, voted on, and now because the general conference isn't happening until 2024. There are those that believe this short-term um, process resolution isn't what we need going forward. Um, so there's, from a business standpoint, there's still much to do, uh, ado about the United Methodist Church. Uh, needless to say, there is division. Um, there continues to be div division and It'll be left to all of us to do just as the pastor said, right? We're going to have to understand what binds us to this world and act in a way that reflects our desire and willingness to, to do what Christ asks us to do and to focus on the world beyond here um, and act in that way. In terms of the rest of the business, um, the pastor was reappointed to serve with us another year. Susan Graham's retired and we have a new superintendent who is kind enough to join us on our her first day of work. So if you aren't here, she was here uh, in July. And that's uh, Melissa Rangers. In November, um, there will be a conference to come together to uh, appoint our bishops. Yes, first week of um, And as you all know from the last uh, session, we have a 
a session, a teaching session for people within the conference who were present on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and it went well, and it reflected, in my opinion, very positively on Wesley, and as a pastor, as our representative at that conference. So that's my report. If you have questions, feel free to seek me after the church. Um, what I would also do is take a privilege on behalf Ginger and I ask that as you're filling out your giving um, envelopes, first we ask you to fill them out, and then fill them out completely. Put your date on them, your name, your address, and your amounts, so that we don't have to go about doing that back in the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Camulet. I would invite everybody to please stand as you are able, join as you are comfortable. Hymn 347 as our song of response, Spirit Song. forgiveness this day for the attitudes and the beliefs that we carry 
that keep us bound and captive to the things of this world. Forgive us, we pray. Let us instead stay focused on the things of above, knowing that we are already raised with Christ. Let us die to the attitudes and beliefs that keep us bound, that we may be set free. Lord, we ask for you to be with us as we continue to seek to be a vital community of faith, as we seek to be a renewed people. Let us follow your way. Let us follow the path that you have laid before us. Make it abundantly clear to us, Lord, that we may know that what we are doing is the work that you have called us to do. Not work that saves, no, Lord, work that praises. Work that shows our gratitude to the world that they may know the truth of freedom found in you. Lord, we ask your healing, your presence, your peace be with Margaret Armstrong. Let her know your love. Let her be filled with the peace that passes understanding as Christ dwells in her. Lord, we ask for healing for Walter, for Mr. Woodruff, for the Mackeys, and for all those not named. And Lord, even as we ask for healing, we sing again with joy, and we praise you for the answered prayers. We are so grateful for the ways that you have healed Dave of his illness. We are so grateful for the ways in which Miss Ofa's nephew is up and in school. Lord, you are a God of miracles. We praise you for the answers to the prayers for Ginger's children, grandchildren, and their move across this country. Be with them as they seek to start their life together. Lord, we praise you for the unnamed joys that are filling our hearts now. Lord, all this we bring before you and we ask by the power of your spirit and in the name of Jesus the Christ who taught us when we are gathered together to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of God. Amen. I would invite you to stand one last time, turn in your bulletin, where you will find our closing song, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus.
you. Woo! You sang it. You're following. No turning back. Right? As you go out into the world this week, remember that you are raised with Christ. You are clothed in love. And you are filled with the spirit that reconciles all. Go knowing what that is and living into the truth of it, my friends, knowing that wherever you go, whatever you do, in all things, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, go with each and every one of you and love you deeply. Amen.